he comes back, and for the next six weeks, we can't get anything else out of him other than you can't believe what's going on in Australia. Welcome to Access All Arias, part of Aria Week, sponsored by Mitsubishi Motors. I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. We have a very, very special treat today. We have two of the key players from YouTube, the, uh, the most popular streaming platform on the planet. We have Leo Cohen, uh, Global Head of Music at YouTube, and Tuma Basa, Director of Black Music and Culture at YouTube. Gentlemen, welcome. Uh, well, thank you, Lars. Thank you so much, Lars. It's good to see you again. Good to see uh, you we guys. We saw each other recently, so it's nice to see you again. Uh, look, gentlemen, it would be amiss for me to not mention politics, and I think politics and music sort of operate in the same world right now. Uh, and the whole world has been watching America, and I, I, I guess you two just feel quite exhausted at the moment. How are you feeling? Uh, personally, I'm, I'm praying for, like, the, the, uh, for stability and for a peaceful transition, uh, personally. And, and uh, I'm glad that things are a little bit more, uh, less tense than what could have been, what could have been, you know? I, I would um, um, second that with what Tuma said, but more importantly to me is, I think the will of the people have spoken, and I think they spoke about harmony and um, finding uh, America in a less polarized way. So I'm hoping that uh, we bring everybody along, even those that voted for Trump. I think it is really important that we um, embrace them and make them feel part of the process. And, you know, it, it troubles me when I see, you know, the um, television uh, um, showing uh, signs of uh, F Trump and, and um, I just don't feel like there is a place for that. Personally, I want to make sure that uh, we, we all come together and w that we do this together. And um, that's, that's what I'm hoping and, and I'm anxious about it because over 70 million U.S. citizens voted for Trump and I don't want them alienated. I want them brought along in the process. And Tuma, you've had an incredible bird's eye view on this entire process. You're based in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, I'm, I'm in the, I'm, yeah. He's yeah. in the sticks. He's in the sticks. Yeah. He's not even <laughs> close to it. Leo's um. <laughs> taking my street credibility away. <laughs> <laughs> There's worse places to be. Look, um, music and politics, they do come together. And Leo, when you and I last spoke, we had, we had Chuck D on the line. Um, and, and I've seen certainly in recent years, uh, artists really using their voice and, and, and a political voice at that. We've seen Sarah Cooper making these incredible videos on YouTube and we've, we've seen Public Enemy release another power pack record. And we, of course we heard Eminem. Um, so it's, I, I guess if there is a silver lining to what we've seen in recent years, I get the feeling that it has created some great art. Oh, I can't wait for the art. I can't wait um, where there's friction, you're gonna see the best art. Listen, I was uh, the child of two hippie uh, Jewish parents in uh, California during the 60s. So I was dragged to all the love-ins. Music is the soundtrack of all sorts of important experiences. I mean you know, the most important moments of people's lives, like um, a wedding, um, before battles, um, and of course, in our most uh, darkest moments, um, music accompanies. And so I'm not surprised how important music is right now during this um, tumultuous time in the world. Listen, we've been dealt a lot of things. A lot of things have happened. We've had the pandemic. You, 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 you know, I know in Australia, you guys have um, worked really hard um, to be COVID free, but in America, it's going ham. It's out of, 
it's out of control. And so, um, you know, many parts of the world have been dealt really significant um, blows. And so music can console, plus all those artists, all those songwriters that are stuck at home. Uh, I, I can't wait to hear this music that's coming out of the pandemic. Tuma? Yeah. Also, there's the economic part is that pockets are drying up right now. So what happens is some of the artists we're going to get, we're going to get their, their starving, their inner starving artists. Uh, we never want anyone to go through that. However, there's a purity that comes with, uh, 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 I don't know, that, that growling, that growling stomach. Like, and, and, and I'm not, and I'm saying that metaphorically, of course, you know? Uh, uh, so I, that's, that's the part that I kind of look forward to is getting that original, that inner that essence of, of the of the, the street level stuff, you know? I guess there, there's a neat segue there into YouTube because if we've seen the economy come to a halt and, and certainly the touring sector has been so badly punished and we can't see uh, when global touring will reactivate. It, it's some months away, maybe a year or so away. Uh, but of course, YouTube um, has been kicking goals throughout this pandemic period. So let's... Let's have a look at perhaps some of the tools that YouTube has has offered to artists to help them monetize their careers. I think that, um, Tuma, do you mind if I answer that first? Yeah, no, no please. No, please. Um, what I see, first and foremost, the biggest tool and the biggest gift is just a massive distribution. It, you know, um, YouTube offers the opportunity for fans to engage with their favorite artists in really meaningful ways throughout the world. So first and foremost, it's the scale of the platform. I would say second of all, we motive, mo um, moved very, very quickly to powwow and understand the fact that artists were shut out from um, their ability to perform live. And I think that in many, many, many um, artists, money, of course, is important to feed the family, but they're thirsty for performance and being able to engage with their fans. And, you know, an artist is an artist first. Um, and then they think about how they can feed their family. So their, their, their lack of, uh, of having uh, the opportunity to engage with their fans in their art has been really difficult and troubling. So, of course, our live product um, was incredibly valuable for uh, the um, artists to do uh, a performance and engage with their fans. We also thought about, well, okay, if they're engaging with their fans, um, maybe there is a way that we could have the fans um, contribute or, or, or pay them through super stickers and um, super chat, um, which are two digital products that are very big in Asia. And, and I, I just feel like um, there's just so much that we can do as a platform. We, we certainly have, you know, merchandise and, and stuff like that, but the most important thing that we've done is listen to our partners, the labels, the publishers, and try to get an understanding of how we could be helpful with this scale, with this platform, what products can we build that could be useful to the music industry. So, um, Tuma, maybe you have some additional things you'd like to say. So all of us um, are in that work from home, work from anywhere phase because of quarantining and COVID. And the one, the one thing I love about the, 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 the live stream and the ability to monetize on live stream is that artists get the chance to work from home too. We already know that they're doing recording uh, from home studios and uh, bedroom closet type of uh, settings and getting that raw music, uh, but the ability to engage with their fans and still earn without having to um, um, having the same exact liberties that we're getting is that we're, we're, we're able to work from home. And work, and work from and the other cool thing about working from anywhere is certain places inspire people. So right now, 
uh, there's a creative out there that's going to, uh, uh, whether it be a Hawaii or a Nantucket or whatever, and, and getting even more inspired than if they were in the city that they had to be in. If that makes any sense, uh, uh, Lars? Of course it does. Yes, it is. Okay, okay. Uh, now, I, I imagine in some years and months from now, we'll be looking back at 2020 as the year of the rise of, of uh, live streaming. Um, I wonder if uh, live streaming is going to be a fad connected with COVID or is this something that will stay with us? Oh, no, well, no this is what live, the COVID did with live streaming. Before, live streaming has been around for a long time, right? And, and YouTube was a big leader, is, is a big leader and has been a big leader for live streaming. Coachella was live stream, et cetera. But live streaming was always kind of a consolation prize, right? Is, is if you couldn't make it, you would catch the live stream, right? What happened with COVID is, so the, the audience at home was kind of like a, a secondary audience. What happened with COVID was the, 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 the target audience was the, was the people at home, the people in the comments. They, they, were, they were paying attention to exactly, they, they were producing the show for you at home. So you didn't feel like you were missing out. You didn't feel like a lame for not being able to get a ticket on the first day at Coachella or wherever, right? So, so what 2020 and COVID did was it made live stream a little bit more mainstream, but it made it like primary, the, the production value, the creativity, value, everything um, was upped. And have you also seen a shift in the acceptance from fans that they need to dig into their pockets and help out their favorite artists? I think we need to work harder than harder in that and making the um, community um, recognize that this is a powerful way of supporting their artists, especially in times in need. And so, because I think a lot of artists are, um, don't feel it's appropriate to um, do what the gamers do. You see, this is a very big thing in gaming where there's a lot of um, super stickers and super chat where they're donating, um, not donating, giving money to the gamers. And um, the audience actually understands it quite well. Um, the audience doesn't understand it yet. And so part of our job is to make the audience understand that this is available to them. We saw an explosion in subscribers for Netflix in the early part of the, the pandemic. And then we saw there was a quarter where the, the numbers actually missed some targets. I wonder, um, how is how has the popularity of YouTube been over the course of the past sort of six to nine months? Have we seen growth? Um, so, so first and foremost, I would say first it was quite large um, prior to the pandemic, and it's gotten even larger. Um, it's been an essential tool for many many people throughout the world where they're enjoying. And, and have the ability to en entertain themselves, particularly in the state, and inform themselves. Um, it's been an incredible source of information. Um, the leadership of YouTube has focused um, insane amount of effort on making sure that um, real voices and authority of how to treat COVID, um, how to respond, the sheltering at home was a big message. Um, so I think that it was an acceleration of the platform, a very large acceleration. Tuma, let's, let's talk a little bit about hip hop. I mean, yeah. I, I, hip, -hop is, hip hop is a global movement, but it was always understood that only American hip hop sold in the world outside the States. But we're certainly, we're seeing a shift now. We're seeing artists like the Kid Leroy, an Aussie kid, kid from Sydney, uh, going to yeah. 10 in the States. Um, is is hip hop uh, sitting in D DC? Do you see hip hop as a global voice at this point? Oh yeah, I mean, I mean hip hop has been global. And, uh, but, what, and but what happens is this, is, this is, this is what's happening is, and, and, and by the way, the live streaming stuff that we're talking about, uh, now if an artist, there were, for many years, a lot of artists in a lot of places uh, couldn't go certain places because of the cost or because of visas, et cetera, et cetera. With live streaming, the only factor or the only variable is time zone, right? 
which 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 matters especially in Australia, which is so different, such a different time zone. I, I look at time zones as a uh, as a as a, a natural resource, right? Like New York and London have a bit of uh, an advantage when it comes to news or media than Los Angeles, which has wakes up three, four hours later and plays catch up. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. Except for TMZ, which is operating in the, in the overnight. So with, with the globalization of hip hop, what's happening is now that there's, there's very little, uh, um, it's borderless, right. Uh, hip hop is becoming borderless. It is, it's, it's, if a song goes viral, if the song goes viral, if there's a dance, et cetera, et cetera, there's no way to tell except for this, uh, uh, the vibes where it's from. The, uh, and uh, yeah, so it's been, it's been, it's, it's, it's been global. It's, it's been global. And Kid Leroy is, part of the reason Kid Leroy is um, popping is because of his association with some of the uh, artists from the States, like G Herbo and the late Juice World, et cetera, et cetera. So even these artists, they come to Australia Right, and and they're they're catching on when ASAP Ferg comes and he sees one four, etc. You know, and then they they collaborate, they they cross pollinate their audience, and then on YouTube they don't know who's from where, and and, and even even the, the Australia has a drill, uh, uh, uh the whole drill scene, yeah. right? You know where that came from? The UK. No, Chicago first. Chicago. Chicago went into the UK, came back to the Brooklyn's. And then uh, 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 Ghana, Australia, Brooklyn all got it at the same time. But it originally it was Chicago, Chief Keefs and all. That was drill music. And then UK caught on. And then it started. Uh, then that's what it really uh, broke. So, th so that's what I'm just saying. It's borderless. Like and, and when the Ghanaian drill, went, it went uh, viral. Like I hate, I hate using the word viral, but that's the only way we can uh, describe when something hits globally, even if it's for a moment, you know? Hip hop has always been collaborative. And with the, with the nature of technology making the world smaller and borderless, uh, I, I guess that has helped hip hop become as huge as, as it is. And Leo, when, I, when we last spoke, I mentioned Travis Scott and the rise of Travis Scott. He, he had a, a McDonald's, a special Travis Scott McDonald's meal this year. Apparently it was the first time a celebrity had a McDonald's meal since Michael Jordan in the 90s. So that gives you an idea of just how, how big hip hop is. Yeah. It's pretty big. It's pretty big. And it seems to be growing. I would say going back to your last question with Kid Leroy, uh, I think that one of the most special factors, first of all, Australian music has been a critical source of global music uh, forever. I mean, uh, it's outsized weight in music period. But Kid Leroy, I would say, one of the things that was the most impressive for me was that he showed up in my office in New York. So he wasn't, you see, there are many artists outside of America that they get big in their local uh, market. They work so hard to get big in their local market that they don't want to start back in the clubs and start at scratch. And that's part of um, the difficulty, you know, here you are, you've been nurturing um, a local market and developing it. You finally um, making much bigger paydays. You're much better known. Um, you've broken through. Why am I going to another country to start from scratch? So what was impressive with Kid Leroy was the fact that he got on a plane um, and he was determined he, he, he told me um, that he was determined to break the, the U.S. market. So um, I thought that was impressive. You know, YouTube is helping make uh, the musical world smaller. You know, with 2 billion logged in um, um, visitors, it's pretty impressive and has the scale and reach that is just opportune for artists that are willing to um, make the effort. The other thing that I would say in this unique period, when I was in India um, launching YouTube Music, one of the meetings I had was with one of their most, I mentioned this to you the last time, one of their India's 
key people in the music business is actually a poet, very well-known poet there. And he says, in India, we see music, we don't hear music. Mm. And so video has, you know, we started as an audio business, um, went to an audio visual business. And I suspect now we're in the visual audio business, which is a real blessing for uh, creative uh, artists and, and YouTube. So we're excited. Australia's excited too, Leo, because we've we've always talked of the tyranny of distance. Australia is a long way from anywhere. And thanks to technology, where Australian artists are able to travel without leaving home. And and in the past 10 years, we've seen a flurry of, of Australian artists, not just breaking, but going supernova. Bands like Sia, artists like Sia and... Uh, Tame and Parlor and Courtney Barnett and, and so many others. It's uh, Australia has always had an outsized weight and seat at the music table, period. And um, we're happy to be part of that. And I'm impressed with how Aria and the whole keeps the drum beat alive and um, keeps everybody focused and, 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 and fighting for Australian artists. I do believe um, one of the most important responsibilities that YouTube have is to make sure that the algorithm um, is sensitive um, to um, um, localization and to help um, empower the local music scene. And we're working very hard at that. Can, can, I, can I add something uh, about Australia? Yes, of course. So Australia has had that influx of, of immigration from West Africa, from East Africa, from Polynesia, etc. And w when I visited last year, I realized those guys are Australian. Like their, their accents are Australian, their, their food preferences, etc. So something that they have, right, um, just the same way you talk about Tame Impala or Sia, right, is they have the ability also to connect with uh, the diaspora, you know, um, the, the African diaspora throughout the world, whether it be the UK or France or in, in America or Canada, etc. Because they're, uh, what, from my observation, they're, they're paying attention to the same exact um, 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 uh, media brands and tastemakers, etc. as they are, as, as a lot of people here. And so that, population, right, with the, the TK Maidzas and all those sample of the greats and, and the, one, the one, one fours and, you know, and be wises and all that. That, 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 that generation is really setting the stage up for the next generation, which I, I think Kid Leroy is a, a part of that, that, you know, because they, they, they have the same level of exposure to the global uh, scene. And, and the, from a competitiveness and from a quality perspective, they're really, you're, you're seeing it in real time. You're seeing the improvement and the growth in real time. And, and, and so there's going to be a, a, a new wave of, of Australian global uh, acts. I'm not saying it's going to happen right away, you know, uh, 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 with time. All it takes one to, for, for the bum rush to start happening. I, th I think the Australian artist community is pretty confident that we're ready as well. Yeah. We, and we tend to be covered across all the genres, country, electronic music, pop, hip hop. Uh, that won't be a problem. Uh, Tumor, I was going to ask you if there are any Australian acts that you've been keeping an eye on and you just reeled off, I think, four of them, Sampa the Great and, and One Four and a few others. Uh, can you, um, are there any other acts that, that from Australia, from the land down under that, that have caught your ear? Oh man, yeah. Oh, there's a, a, a bunch. Uh, well, I mean, and, and 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 it was really when I went down there for the the Tasman Keiths and the, you know, uh, it was it was with the lady Maisha. I, I really liked her. Yep. Um. Uh. Oh my gosh. What was that? What, what, camouflage Rose. Uh. It, it was. It was just. I mean, there was a lot. You know, and, and also the, the the people. Like you know, I I would absorb like from how over at Triple J. Like he, he schooled me on so much at, at, at YouTube. They, they, they gave me a whole breakdown about um, what, what are these guys, the Hilltop Hoods, yeah. and, uh, you know, what I mean? and, and that whole history and the whole, the, the, the tension between rapping in an Australian accent and rapping in, in, in a, a pseudo American accent. So, uh, 
Yeah, so the, I mean, this I mean, it's too many to mention. I would, like it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was good. It was, it was interesting. Very interesting stuff. Lars, you have to understand that um, because we're a global platform, and we actually have people in the region, like Marion, Ruben, you know, for too much to be popping off all these artists, it takes the local team to encourage him to come down to Australia. You see, it works in reverse too. It's not just about the artists going and, and packing their bags and going through the world. It's actually when we as um, lovers and, and, and believers in the impossible and music um, get on planes and come and visit and participate, our team on the ground, Marion, you slice her open, and she just bleeds music. I mean, she's, she's bringing Tuma into the main vein of what's happening in Australia, and it's, he comes back, and for the next six weeks, we can't get anything else out of him other than you can't believe what's going on in Australia. And he's evangelizing this to people over and over and over in every meeting. And it helps contextualize what we do. And so I'm grateful for, um, you know, Tuma um, making the effort to go down. He, he was such a hit that they wanted him back. They want him in Indonesia. <laughs> I was going to um, come back with or without invite. <laughs> I believe I spoke on the stage straight after you last year, Tuma. So hope me, uh, hopefully next year we'll have you back in the oh, flesh. I, I can't wait. I can't wait. And then, I can't wait. And, then think. And, and, and last year it was during Thanksgiving in America. And, and when I got back, it, I didn't feel like, oh, I was like, oh, it was, you know. It was like I was. It was. It was such a great trip that I was like, "Oh my gosh!" You know, like, uh, like yeah, I'll come. I'll come next Thanksgiving even. Lars, tell me what platform can have a concert with Powderfinger? That I mean, what a moment! What an absolute moment for um the Australian music scene. You know and. And what's, what we've also experienced, and Tuma can attest to this as well, is during this pandemic, many artists from the Stones on down have emptied their vaults and put up moments and concerts and, and experiences that we've never seen. I think that's hugely um, important for, and so I think that, I mean, one of the blessings for us is when Ruben um, called us up and said, you know, we could put this powder finger thing together and, and the band will come together and, and do something for um, um, the Australian um, um, community. And like, wow. It was a huge moment, and um, certainly I hosted a powder finger party. It was socially distanced, of course, but we had a powder finger party uh, at our place. And it's behind the, the powder finger live stream was a charitable angle. So th that particular stream raised more than five hundred thousand dollars for Support Act, which um, beautiful, which which looks after um, crew and and staff in the music industry. And we've also seen that as, as an aside from streaming, uh, the, the live streaming of gigs is the charitable aspect. We're yeah. getting the names of charities out there and we're generating hard cash for charities. You know, I, I have to tell you that the music team at YouTube has been working since this pandemic, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We feel like even though we may not be next to COVID, but we are on the front lines because, uh, you know, we feel an obligation and an opportunity um, to help bring the artists and their fans together during this insanely crazy time. And so we keep reminding ourselves, Lars, that we're working in a unique 
um, moment in time where media is rapidly changing. And so to have the powder finger event or Bocelli at, on Easter, it's just humbling. And that's what, why we work so hard that we, and we are passionate at what we do, at what we do for the simple reason that we could um, spread the love that we work, we literally work in the music business. We help artists, songwriters, and we try to connect fans with their favorite um, artists. It's just an in incredible, humbling, incredible experience for us. You, uh, you mentioned Andrea Bocelli's performance at the Duomo during, uh, at Easter time, which was which was quite an event. Um, obviously, the production was was lavish and, and gorgeous, uh, but there is there is a stereotype that classical music fans aren't technically abled or or even luddites, and that sort of that that performance at live stream dispelled that notion. <laughs> three point three million concurrent fans watching 3.3 million how many stadiums is 3.3 million stadiums mm -hmm. that were able to experience that moment i mean that moment came just so you understand when we saw some social media when you know covid struck the italian country very very hard very early on and we started seeing images of people in their balconies singing. Mm. You know, the, the, the singing spirit of the Italian culture. And that's what created this opportunity. It was that moment, the, watching um, the Italian um, people on their balconies singing um, is the impetus and the idea when Bocelli decided to do Duomo. And it was like, for example, when I tell um, my mother is 90 years old, staying away from COVID. And I, she says recently, um, so, you know, son, you've been working in the music business for 40 years. Like, tell me some of the highlights. And I said, mom, I remember Public Enemy at the Ritz in New York City and the whole, I thought the building was going to collapse. There was so much enthusiasm. I, there was, it was just like a breathtaking moment. And um, Bocelli from Duomo, and my mother was so confused. Um, public mm -hmm. Enemy and Bocelli in the same um, sentence. Um, it, I don't know. It just, it, this world is kooky and is... You know, I just recently had a baby, a four month old baby. And part of the, oh, um, my baby announcement was uh, an Al Green song, Simply Beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful records I've ever heard, um, was the music bed. But the first quote was a Mark Twain quote. I, I'm sure I'm going to kill it. It's, um, why am I always out on a limb? because that's where the fruit is. And that's just how I feel. Like I'm gonna stay on a limb, um, trying to continue, you know, bringing artists and, and, and their fans together and advocating for artists and songwriters. That's what we do every single day. And so, yeah, it's, it's been kind of bizarre, but cool. Leo, I'm, I'm sensing a lot of optimism coming from you for the uh for the time ahead Are you feeling optimistic oh I'm so, opti I'm so optimistic number one again i live in friction i love friction okay mm. when things are nice and cushy and um i have to tap out like there's someone who operates really well during cushy times i operate really well during friction i love the music um the talent um Man, I'm looking forward to something that represents these kids that have come in this um, most bizarre time in this world. Um, and what are they going to ride for? Who are they going to ride with? 
Um, I'm just so fascinated. And yes, I'm optimistic because I don't know. I just, I'm just curious. I, I stay curious. It's not optimistic just because I think the world is like um, um, tripping through the um, tulips. I think the world's incredibly um, uh, difficult period. You know, there's um, a small fraction of people that are doing really, really well, and most of people are fucked up. And the disparity between um, rich and poor is exacerbated. The middle class has been shrinking. Um, I don't think this world is in a good position. Climate change, man, my colleagues in, in California, all those engineers are suffocating with those fires. Um, there's a hurricane a day. Um, um, shit's so funky, people um, have forgotten that there is more that, than, that unites us together than separates us. And the good news is I know music helps find that commonality. I remember thinking about um, every time I went to London, no matter what taxi I got on, uh, they said, I'm a remainer, I'm a, I'm a stayer, you know, who, what, what, you know, where do you stand? And they were so polarized. That society was so polarized. But I, the first thing I said, can we just agree that Jimmy Page is a rock god? Mm. And boom, they understood. Wow, you're right. Jimmy Page, a remainer, a stayer, they agreed Jimmy Page is a rock god. And mm. so um, I think music has an outsized um, responsibility to um, help um, bring us together and remind each other that we have much more in common than what separates us. I'm sorry mm -hmm. I'm a run-off sentence. Tuma. No. No, perfect. no I agree. Right. Tuma, is there, a, is, there, is there an American Jimmy Page? Is there someone who, who, who you see as the god of, of music who unites everyone in a cab? Uh, he unites everyone in the cab. Bob Marley, but he's—I mean, he's not here with us. But I, I but for, but he, for some reason, no matter where you are, it's almost unanimous. You know that uh, the, his music brings people together. I mean, from my generation, that's Jay Z, hope. You know, what I mean, he's talking about God. That's a hope. Like uh, Leo actually has a relationship with them and everything. Uh, but uh, so so so, but. Yeah, Bob Marley is probably the you know the, the Jimmy Page at least in my, in my life my lived experience you know. There's a there was a great scenario some years ago when Michael Levis, the the, the boss of Glastonbury Festival, booked Jay Z as the headline act on the Pyramid stage, and there was a whole line of British artists, including Noel Gallagher from Oasis, stepped forward and and rubbished the idea of Jay Z performing. There was a lot of animosity. Until well, well, you know what he did? He did Wonderwall. He, he, yeah, he hit the stage and blew yeah. everyone away. Yeah. And there were 90,000 people in a field watching Jay-Z. And I'm told that yeah. um, for weeks afterwards, no one could stop talking about how yeah. awesome Jay-Z was. So. I was there. Oh, you were there? Of course I was there. I wasn't going to miss that. Oh, okay, yeah. Glastonbury, to me, uh, has it all. Has it all. The man... That, that thing is the real deal. If anybody that's listening to this that wants to go to Mecca for music, it's Glastonbury, period. There's no second to Glastonbury. And, and, uh, uh, the, the, and he's married to the, the other, the goddess. Like, you know, so if you think about it, uh, Beyonce also has the same, well, uh, actually with females way more. Uh, the type of that global appeal where you can make, make some friends by just uh, praising her. What Beyonce did at Coachella is nothing short of miraculous. I was there like, with you. I was there. Yeah, we, we were like, this is not possible. This is not going down right now. I mean, I never seen someone so focused. Well, you know, Lior, you know what's so interesting that you talk about her, like, uh, uh, going back to what Lars was talking about, live streaming COVID. Beyonce at Coachella, she was performing for the audience at home. She made, that live stream made Coachella a global brand, right? Uh, literally, because if you remember the first weekend 
right? The first I, I was in South Africa the first weekend. I, I came for the second weekend. First weekend, I was at the airport, and the woman at the airport knew about Coachella because of YouTube. And then right there, I said, oh, my gosh, this is like an award show. Where if you go to an award show, they're not performing for the people in Radio City or Staples Center. They're performing for people at home. So, so that was like the early sign about the potential of live streaming and, and, and performing for the people at home and uh, catering to them first, you know? Well, we know that it was something special because we're still talking about it. Gentlemen, yeah. gentlemen I've really had a great time chatting um, over the last three quarters of an hour. Um, good luck for the next year ahead. Oh, thank Lars, you, thank when you. am I going to see you next? Next week? Tomorrow? Or next <laughs> month? Well, you know, Leo, next time it happens, I hope it's in the flesh. I hope we get to sit down and have a beer together. Yeah, I, I would love that. I would love that. I want to give a big shout out to Dan Rosen and the Aria yeah. Award. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And thank you for including us. Thank you for um, listening to us. Um, we're just passionate and love what we do. And we're grateful to be here with all of you. And I hope you have a great um, um, rest of the week. So take good care. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.